and we return the two list values, which are references still to our lists. Now you get back, get In today's class on Perl, we're going to take a look at subroutines and modules. Perl subroutines are declared by saying, here's a subroutine, I'm going to give it some name like func, function, and I'm going to use curly brackets to delineate where the subroutine begins and ends. Remember the special variables in Perl, one of the special variables is at underscore. You've seen dollar underscore many times. Dollar underscore is a scalar that's used whenever we don't provide a particular scalar variable name. So at underscore is an array that's used when we don't provide an array name or one's not available to us. For example, when we're using a subroutine. So we can start by saying, let's get the arguments that were passed to this function, they'll be passed in at underscore. We can take out those arguments, we can process them with some other Perl code, and we can return our result. Here I've just returned a single scalar as a result. We can return arrays and we can return other things too. What happens if you have another variable somewhere else in your code that's called $result? When you call this function, it would overwrite the value of $result that occurs elsewhere. And in programming, that's called scoping. So with Perl, we define scope with the my keyword. So for example, in our function, we can say my at arguments are equal to at underscore. The scope of that variable is just within this particular subroutine. When we get to this closing parentheses here, that variable disappears and it either returns to some other value, if there's a global variable as well, or it just completely disappears and is garbage collected. Here we have my dollar result is equal to something. The value of dollar result is only valid within the scope of this particular subroutine. There's a problem with this and with the way that Perl handles functions. All of the arguments get passed through this at underscore special variable. Because all the parameters are passed via at underscore, how do we pass around arrays or hashes? You can't call something like this. For example, at result one, at result two, is equal to function at list one, at list two. When we try and break out our two lists that we're passing in, Perl doesn't know where one list begins and where one list ends. Similarly, when we try and return our two lists, Perl doesn't know where one result begins and one result ends. So the way around this is to use references. And we looked at references in a previous Perl lecture. The way that we do it is that we say reference one, reference two is equal to, and we pass a reference to the list. So we reference the list by escaping the at sign, and that means don't pass the list itself, pass the reference to the list. So here we have two lists, we pass the references to the function, they become scalars. Remember, when we take a reference to a list, it's a scalar. We do some work on these lists, they get returned as two scalars, and if we wish, we can dereference them back to arrays 
to process them. That's pretty much all there is to using subroutines in Perl. We just declare a subroutine. It doesn't matter the order. You don't have to declare it before you call it. You can declare it after you call it. You can declare it anywhere in your code. And Perl will try and do the right thing. In Perl 5, we introduce the use of modules. And modules allow people to write code and reuse them time and time again. The problem that modules were designed to overcome is what's called namespacing. If you get to the XML tutorial that I have online, we talk a great deal about namespaces and how that applies to XML documents. This is a similar idea. If I have a variable called name in my code, and you have a variable called name in your code, how do I stop one piece of code from overriding the other? Modules provide a namespace that limits the use of the variables to that particular module. There are two ways that we can call modules. There's the traditional, the original, the first way around it, which is to use the special delimiter, which is two colons. And then there's the more object-oriented approach, which evolved a little bit later and really has become the dominant way of using modules, which is to use the specific delimiter, delimiter hyphen and a greater than sign. This is supposed to remind you of an arrow. The variable is going to point towards the module. So how do we actually build a module? Well, we start with a file called rob.pm, or whatever you want to call your module, .pm, for Perl module. And we declare that we're going to have a package. And in my case, I've called my package rob. You can call your package whatever you would like. When we import that package with the use rob command, Perl goes and looks for rob.pm and looks for all declarations of package within that rob.pm file. We can have multiple classes. For example, we can have package one, package two, package three. And we can use them with declarations like use package one, use rob package two, and use rob package three, etc. In computer science, we worry a lot about inheritance. Not just because we're all poor and we're trying to get some money from our parents, but because we need to know how one package relates to another package. In Perl, we use isa to define a package that inherits from another package. So if I define a package rob and say that this is a person, that implies that rob inherits from the class person. In fact, we can use isa to declare rob inherits from two different classes. This is messy, it's called multiple inheritance. I'm not going to go into the details about this, but there are not many programming languages that really allow multiple inheritance. So let's take a look at an inheritance example. I'm going to start with a package called person. This is going to define the people that I have in my class. Among all the people I know, many of those people are at SDSU. So I'm going to have a class of people that are at SDSU. And at SDSU, everybody there has an ID, for example. All the people I know have a, well, let's say a name. So everybody has a name, and at SDSU, Everybody has an ID. And then some of the people I know at SDSU are students. 
And out of those students, they all have, let's say, a GPA. So I'm going to have a pretty simple inheritance hierarchy where I have person, SDSU, and students. People have names, SDSU students have IDs, and uh, students have a GPA. So I'm going to have a little directory called inheritance, and I'm going to start by making my person package. So I'm going to say my package is called person, and that person is going to have a name. And I want to know if somebody passes me a name, then I'm going to remember it. So I have the special variable self that refers to myself because I'm a person. And then I'm just going to say if somebody passes in a name, then I'm going to set the value of name to be equal to name. Now what I've got here is self is a reference to a hash. So I'm declaring the element in the hash with the, val with the key name to have a value of $n. When I call this package, the way that I call it, I pass in the reference to the package. If I call it with other arguments, that gets passed in as optional additional arguments to that function. So the next arguments will be passed in as $n. Regardless of how I'm called, I'm going to return the value of my name. So this is a pretty simple piece of code. What it does is if somebody passes me a name, I remember it. And if they don't pass me a name, I return the name I have. That's my whole package for now. Now I'm going to have a package that I'm going to call sdsu.pm. And then in that, I'm going to say this is my package, sdsu, and that I'm going to use person because I want to say that SDSU people are people. And I'm going to declare using at isa that SDSU is a type of person. My SDSU person has an ID. And just like we saw with name, I'm going to use the same type of code where I check to see if I get past an ID as a parameter, and I'm going to say if $ID, then remember that as ID. And then return the ID at the end. Oops. Okay, let me just open both the SDSU and the person. I want to add one thing I forgot to add. In Perl, all of the packages should return true. And the way to do that that's really simple is just add a one at the end of the package. That way it always returns true. But I also want to point out here, remember Tim Twody. There's more than one way to do things. So here I say, if this value is true, then do this. If and this. Here I say, if this value is true, then do this. These two things do exactly the same thing. They're just two different ways of writing the same piece of code. Okay, so I have a student, and I have a person, and then the final class that I'm going to have it, sorry, I have a SDSU member and a person. The final class that I'm going to have is my student class. So I'm going to say that my student package, and I'm going to use SDSU, 
and I'm going to say that a student is an SDSU person. I'm going to declare a type of student so that I can instantiate a student object. When I do that, the only thing I get passed is myself, which is my type of my class. When I do this, I want to define an anonymous hash that I'm going to use later on. And I'm going to call that self. I'm now going to say that this anonymous hash that I've just created is a member of the class of which I'm the prototypical type. And finally, I'm going to return myself. This is a, a very standard um, piece of code that you often see in packages that allows you to instantiate an object using object-oriented programming principles. And now let's say we're going to define a GPA. So here I'm going to have a GPA, and I'm going to use exactly the same code that we've seen in previous cases. My self GPA is at underscore. That's our special case. And then if we have a GPA, then we're going to set GPA to be the value. And we're going to return the value of GPA. OK. So we have a person class. We have an SDSU class. Not quite. We have an SDSU class. And we have a student class. Now all we need to do is to write a class, or write a piece of Perl code rather, that we can use to combine these and to test them out. So here I'm going to make a new piece of code called teststudent.pl. This is just standard Perl code, and I'm going to start it with what's called a shebang, user bin Perl. And that means if I make this file executable, I can just run it um, as it is. And then I'm going to just have a little comment. This is a test code to demonstrate inheritance. OK. I'm going to use the student class. Here's my student class. When I do that, that uses the STSU class over here. When I do that, that uses the person class over here. And I'm going to say my student is a new student. So that's going to call my new subroutine right here that's going to instantiate an object of type student and bless that object. And now I can go ahead and set, let's say, uh, I can set a name. I can set an ID. And I can set a GPA. Notice that I instantiate a student. Student inherits from SDSU. SDSU inherits from person. When I instantiate my student, I can set the GPA because I have a GPA function here in my student class. I can set the ID because I have an ID function here in my SDSU, 
U class. And I can set the name because I have a name function in my person class. Finally, I can print all of this out and say print the student has a name which is and let's just to turn a little line wrapping on so you can see and the student has an ID of dollar student and that ID and the student has a GPA of and let's have a look at my GPA to see how good it is and then we'll end with a new line let's exit all of these pieces of code and type Perl test student and there we go the student has a name Rob the student has an ID of one two three and the student has a GPA of four so we've taken four very simple classes so three very simple classes and we've used inheritance to combine them so that we can inherit from a student that has GPA to SDSU that has ID and person that has name so this simple overview of inheritance in Perl introduced you to the modules and some concepts associated with them. When you look at CPAN, the Comprehensive Perl Archive Network, you can see a whole lot more modules that other people have deposited. And I encourage you to download some of those, take a look at them, and explore the Perl code that's written in them.